mixture of my research and a mixture of practice and a mixture of teaching the subject area, I, I'm sort of bringing a lot of experiences together uh, today. And some of the amazing people that have started to work with me along this, this particular journey. So our symposium today, it's titled School Mental Health, and it's trying to get across about uh, important information about some of the key issues um, and also the outcomes of a curriculum-based preventative mental health program uh, that we're going to talk about today called Hopeful Minds. Um, I'm going to introduce you to some of the people who helped us source this particular amazing program. Um, first of all, I'll just introduce to you um, the person who's going to speak after me today. This is Catherine Boitsky. And Catherine is from the United States and she developed the Hopeful Minds curriculum. She's also the director of the International Foundation for Research on Education to Prevent Depression. Um, she also has a her own company. She'll tell you a little bit about that herself. Uh, but she founded Hopeful Minds um, and created you know, uh, the curriculum with a team of experts. Um, and then after, um, I, after Catherine speaks, Mary Dunn here is going to speak. Mary has just retired recently from the Western Trust as a specialist mental health promotion officer. Um, she's worked for many, many years um, in the area of trying to prevent mental health issues. And she's also been the suicide prevention coordinator as well for the Western Trust for a period of time. So Mary had sourced the Hopeful Minds programme and she basically brought it here to, to Northern Ireland. And my particular role was to try and carry out the research evaluation of the programme. So I'm, I'm also really delighted here to, to kind of end our symposium talk by uh, introducing Nigel Frith, who's the principal of Drumrath College. Um, who's really taken this particular approach and uh, has demonstrated good practice. And he has uh, piloted, he's been big, in, uh, he's had big involvement in piloting the programme and demonstrating its impact on the ground. So he's going to talk to us about his experiences of delivering the programme. And it, there's also a little video clip that we want to present at the end, which is a docu BBC documentary uh, called Teens on the Edge, where Hopeful Minds has been. <coughs> Uh, showcased uh, as, a, as, a, as a particular programme that seems to demonstrate some important impact for young people. Then I'll finish off with talking about some of the research outcomes just to, clo to close the symposium today. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about my the first talk here is, and I think it's important to give people a sense of well, what are we dealing with and I think we all appreciate that yes young people it's in the media all the time in terms of the mental health issues that seem to be rising uh, what I wanted to present to you is just some of the literature and some of the information that I have sourced uh, that's really telling us the scale of, of the problem that we're dealing with. I also wanted to present to you a little bit about the global evidence uh, on preventative school-based approaches. What are, other, uh, what are the findings you know, from other places in terms of what works? Um, but I'm just going to cover that kind of briefly. Um, then I want to talk about hope theory itself and try to highlight that this particular program is not sort of just created and just pulled together ad hoc. There's a real strong theoretical framework behind the essence of the program itself. Um, and then, uh, as I say, I'll talk about the outcomes of the pilot programs that we carry out with two pilot programs um, starting in 2016, 17, and then again uh, just last year. So I've just highlighted what I'll talk about, so I'll just move on. So yeah. The key issues, uh, what, what are we talking about here? But before I kind of really get into that, I just wanted to highlight, I suppose we all know this, okay? But I wanted to just really mention what something we should keep in the back of our minds. Whenever we're trying to look at um, mental health issues, we have to realise that young people are naturally going through uh, lots of changes. And this particular journal here, and Nature Reviews, it's a neuroscience journal, is really telling us that yes, the peak age of onset of many psychiatric or mental health disorders is in adolescence, because it's also a remarkable time for physical and behavioural changes. So I just wanted to keep that, just mention that, that we have to appreciate that there's a lot of cerebral cortex changes, synaptic pruning changes, uh, and you know, maturation of the, the frontal lobe. So that's all happening for a young person. Hormonal changes is all going on in the background. But nevertheless, despite all of that, we also have to get an appreciation for, well, so, so that's fine, but what's really, how bad is it here in Northern Ireland in terms of mental health, mental health issues? So in my research, I sourced um, information from the uh, 
Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. Um, they produced a report in April 2017, so it's very up to date and it's telling us about uh, lots of things, including the prevalence and the uh, identification of need. So I'm just going to present some of the information from that particular report, just to draw our attention to it. And the areas that uh, I suppose that I wanted to get across, and we've probably heard these particular statistics quite a few times, but just in the context of Northern Ireland, and I'm just conscious that we're in the presence of Catherine here from the States, and I wanted her to get a sense of how how uh, difficult it is here in Northern Ireland because we're experiencing the legacy of the troubles and the transgenerational impact. But just in terms of adults, uh, what we know in Northern Ireland is that um, around one in five adults in Northern Ireland will experience signs of mental illness. But even our Bamford review that we've heard quite a lot about, we also appreciate that here in Northern Ireland there are 25% higher rates of mental health than other parts of the UK. However, for under 18s, the prevalence is less clear, and that's because we don't have uh, uh, epi epidemi epidemiological research. We don't have a, st a standard recurring population survey here in Northern Ireland in terms of the mental health prevalence rates. Um, and hopefully we'll, that will change, but we're dealing with it, we're, what we have at the minute is all, all that we have. So in the absence of that, we're kind of looking at English-based surveys to benchmark some of the prevalence rates and some of the issues but there's a recognition that is probably quite an underestimation because of the specific circumstances here in Northern Ireland and the impact of the conflict. But the, the, despite that limited data, the Nikki report is telling us that yes, there's mental health difficulties are increasing during the teenage years. And this, this, is, this increasing prevalence rate uh, is, is it's most notable in Northern Ireland, but the scale and the complexity is also most notable. Uh, and it also seems to be appearing at a much, much younger age as well, which is really uh, something that we have to draw our attention to. So in, in my own kind of uh, exploration of the literature, it kind of it does alarm me. I have young kids myself, I have teenagers, and I kind of want to know well, what is happening in, in our schools that will do, do something to prevent some, some of these issues. I also drew upon uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly report about mental health in Northern Ireland. I'm sure you've all come across this yourselves as well. It's all freely down, downloaded, you can download it freely. But just to highlight to you again, in terms of young people, they reported that around 45,000 children and young people in Northern Ireland have a mental health need at any one time. And there's about 20% of these have significant serious mental health problems by the time they reach 18. We also realise too that 50% of these mental health problems emerge by the age of 14. And we also know from our uh, studies as well that if, you're, if some particular conditions aren't treated, uh, there's a 50-50% chance that, that will continue on into their mid-adolescence and, and continue right throughout their lives and become more chronic and complex. Um, but in terms of the Nikki report, they've highlighted three particular areas um, uh, of poor mental health, and they and some of these findings that I'm going to present today were quite I was quite startled by them myself in terms of the disproportionately high rates of suicide, <coughs> the under 18s, uh, the antidepressant uh, prescription rates for the not to 18 year olds, and also the self harm rates as well. And I'm going to present some just some slides just on those. What what do they tell us about those in particular? So the antidepressant rates, there's an upward trend here in Northern Ireland for, the, for children and young people being prescribed antidepressants. And in this particular report, they're telling us that in 2014 and 15, there were 550 under 16s, 5,516 to 19 year olds were prescribed antidepressant or anti-anxiety drugs. And this was representing a year on year increase. And it's also indicating that yes, there must be some serious mental health problems here if we've got so many of our young people are being prescribed you know, medication in this way. But it also highlights to this, well, maybe there's another reason, maybe that they're not being offered uh, appropriate psychological interventions at the right time. And that's something that's kind of been highlighted too. However, and some of the, there's no studies that are telling us, you know, well, what exactly, what type of therapies are being offered to young people? There's no publicly available statistics on that. But all we can tell you is that across the five different trusts, uh, they are offering some very different approaches. So not everything is the same and not everything is standardised. Um, and one little shocking bit of information that I was really disappointed to hear, uh, which was about the, the significant lack of funding. And I know we're in a situation with our Northern Ireland Assembly here, 
Um, but there was only 50, I, I have to say only, because it is only, only £50,000 uh, was offered, it was a regional recurrent funding of £50,000 to CAMS training and psychological therapies in 2015-16. So that's just not one trust, that's regional, you know, which is pretty, pretty poor, pretty, pretty, pretty disappointing. Um, and that report as well is also telling us in terms of access to services, there's a 10 year delay apparently between young people presenting with their first symptoms and then getting actual support. It's also indicating that many young people, are, they're not accessing mental health services even when they actually report that they're experiencing serious mental health problems. They're not presenting for, for, for help. This is quite important and, uh, for very vulnerable uh, groups like young, pe uh, care, young people in care, those living in poverty, going through the justice system, long-term disability, and, and so on. Now, the suicide rates are kind of even more shocking, I have to say, um, and they're quite disproportionate to the rest of the UK. And I'll just go through these for you, uh, but in what we have found here is that uh, in th there were 318 suicides registered in Northern Ireland during 2015, and of these, 132 were aged between 15 and 34 years of age. The NICU report tells us a little bit more. They're telling us that in uh, 2012, there was a five-year average suicide rate for 15 to 19-year-olds that was four times higher in Northern Ireland compared to anyone in Wales. And what was really shocking was the 10 to 14-year-olds were 10 times higher compared to other parts of the UK. Um, so these annual suicide rates are uh, also consistent for, for males uh, in particular as well. And the, the 15 of the 18 registered deaths uh, of the 19 year olds were, were actually males as well. So these were, I found these really disturbing and really sort of shocking statistics. But the self-harm rates as well too, I think what we have to highlight too is that now a lot of our young people are self-harming to cope. And this report is telling us here again that self-harm rates, um, the, these young people who are presenting through their a &E department, through their emergency department, uh, what they noted in the uh, 2016 report here, that there was an increase of 30% in 15 to 19 year olds, and a further 14% in the under 16s as well. Um, and the reason why this is so important, as you know, is that self-harm is a key predictor of completed suicide. So if it's, if it's presented and if it's, if it's something young people are using and to cope, um, then it's something that we, we really need to target as best we can. And everyone here in this room knows that, but it's something <coughs> that we have to become alarmed about because it seems to be quite high here in Northern Ireland. Now those figures are probably quite an underestimation because they're only the young people who presented to A&E departments. They're not young people that don't, don't present to A&E departments. So we carried out a study at, at Ulster University to try and determine that, and the paper that we published was trying to look at self-harm, self comparing self-harm thoughts and behaviours among community samples, this was a school sample uh, of younger and older adolescents in, in Northern Ireland, and just very briefly what we found, uh, compared to the only other study uh, that we know of was by Professor Rory O'Connor, who carried out a, a study with 3,500 young people aged between 15 and 18 years of age. That was the that was the age range that he carried out his, his prevalence survey. And at that time, he found that there was 10% of young people who were acting out self-harm in, in a school population, and that there was 13% who had serious thoughts of self-harm. Now, in our two other recent studies at Ulster University, um, we carried out, we used the exact same measure, the case survey, which is a European standardised tool for measuring self-harm and trying to understand the predictors of it. <coughs> um, we carried it out in, in 2017 and published that it was 13%, but the actual thoughts of self-harm were uh, 19%. So one in five pupils were thinking about self-harming. Now, interestingly, that seemed to drop. Thinking about it seemed to drop in a recent one, and this has been in the same school. Uh, to 9%, however, the actual acts of self-harm increased to 17%. Um, so that was quite alarming as well, the, the jump um, between. I know these are snapshots in time and it's not a longitudinal study or anything, but it's just given us a, a, an idea you know, of, of what we're dealing with here. Um, now, Aurora O'Connor's study didn't look at uh, under 11 years old, so we did. We managed to do a very painful, rigorous ethics application procedure. We managed to lower our age range to 11, and we were able to find out, are, are that younger group actually self-harming as well? What are they doing? And the two studies, again, um, 
found that it was 6% uh, of actual self-harm in 2017, but there recently it's up to 10. So it's one in 10 people are, are, are carrying out the act of self-harm. And again, about one in 10 who are actually thinking about it as well. So um, that's that's worrying, and they're they're in school, they're in their classrooms, they're in they're they're pre they're present and they're there, and this is the coping mechanism that they're using. Um, in our other studies, and also uh, in this study that, that, that we try to look at the, the predictors of it, and this is where I'm getting to the reason why we wanted to do something in schools, why I felt it was important that we we did some kind of preventative intervention in schools, because what we find in our study was that yes, whilst we know the risk factors of self-harm, things like being female, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, emotional dysregulation, we also found things like bullying, uh, poor coping strategies, low self-esteem and so on were, were big risk factors for self-harm. But interestingly, the protective factors, and this is probably what we need to really zoom our focus on, we have to try and draw our attention to, well, what protects, what buffers a young person from self-harming? And what it appears to be is emotional resilience, good problem solving skills, positive coping strategies, uh, and good peer and family relationships. The other thing that we know about these protective factors is that they, they can be taught, they're skills. They're skills that can be actually taught. But what made, what was kind of raised awareness for me is we can't always rely and guarantee on parents being able to teach those skills. We don't know. We're in, we're in a, a a community where there's experience of transgenerational impact of trauma. So we don't know if, if there's a parent able to share and teach those very positive protective skills. We, we're not sure about that. So where else could it be happen? Where else could it, could it occur? Um, potentially this is where the idea of the schools came in. So it helped me to kind of direct my focus on um, what we need to do. But before I kind of move on to some of the evidence of school-based approaches, I'll just highlight just our recent published, or it's not published yet, it's just analysed, but we wanted to look at the anxiety. And there's nothing on this currently in, the, in the, any of the Northern <coughs> literature at all, uh, but we were able to look at the prevalence of anxiety in a school sample. And what we're looking at is two in every 10, 17%, or almost, sorry, two in every 10. And depression, 11%, and it's one in every 10. So it was really a bit startling as well to appreciate that this this is the, the kind of grim picture that we're that we're faced with and why we've got to do something about it. So how should schools respond then? What, what can they? Can they? Are they able to respond? Can, what can they do? You know, they're teachers. They're trained to teach a curriculum. They're trained to teach an academic subject. They're not trained, you know, to deal with these issues that are in their classroom and. From a lot of the uh, studies, we published a, another paper in the Irish Teachers Journal uh, recently, and it highlighted that the teachers really do feel overwhelmed by this. It is very stressful for them. They're very worried that if they begin to even have a conversation with young people about some things, that they're ill-equipped, they're unskilled, that they may open up a can of worms, that they're not able to close, and who's there afterwards to do something about it. So they're kind of really reaching out and asking us for help. Can you please help us train us? We need something during our initial teacher training. We need more CPD. And they're really desperate for it. They're really, really asking for it. This is just an image here just to give us an idea of how much they're asking for it. You know, there's press reports highlighting that teachers and campaigners are saying that young people are under pressure, but the support is underfunded and that there's an intolerable mental health crisis uh, 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 that young people are presenting in schools. Um, other reports are telling us that schools across the UK are, are dealing with a mental health epidemic, with school leaders reporting a rise that they have noticed in their careers in stress, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, self-harm and eating disorders. That's the teachers' own reports about what they know, what they see in school on a daily basis. But the consequences, what are the consequences, you know? And again, I keep thinking about my own, you know, 16-year-old and a 14-year-old, and I have a 7-year-old and a 5-year-old, and that's always what makes this kind of really hardy for me, it connects. You know, what does it mean, you know, if these things are happening, you know, in school? Um, and it's, it's going to have a significant impact on their social relationships, but, you know, particularly their school and occupational team. And that message is now starting to slowly drip through to the, the, the school leaders, to the Department of Education, the look, you've got to start appreciating that if you want high grades, which seems to be the big focus um, in schools at the minute, you're not going to be able to achieve that if, you're, if you can't focus on the mental health and well-being of the young people as well. Um, the other implications are on their self-esteem, their behaviour, their attendance, uh, social connect connectedness and so on. Um, 
And this, this, uh, this is from a report here from the, anybody can look this up, this is all freely available. Um, very, very uh, good resource actually, the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health website. I would have a look at that, there's loads of information. But I just drew out something here from that particular page in school-based interventions and they're highlighting that mental health problems uh, again in childhood are linked to educational failure. And these in turn, the educational failure itself, are in turn associated with increased rates of psychiatric disorder. So we have a real onus on us, you know, as a, a multidisciplinary team of psychologists, teachers, nurses, whoever's involved in it to do, do something if we can to prevent. The Mental Health Foundation are really getting the message out there that we have to make mental health part of the curriculum. It cannot be extracurricular any longer. It really has to change. Um, so they're saying make it count. Mental health is not extracurricular. The Shaw Foundation are also kind of highlighting, you know, that we have to make a mental health education compulsory in primary and, and secondary schools. Now, there's lots of things happening, and I'm not saying that there's nothing happening, but it needs to be more standardised. There needs to be some more evidence base in terms of what, what actually is being uh, delivered. But what does the government want? And, and I'm just kind of uh, going to highlight, I thought it was important to kind of get across, well, what, what, what are they saying about this? Um, the Green Paper in 2018, July there, last year, um, they are kind of, I'm just going to summarise very quickly for you, they have kind of four key areas that they have highlighted in the Green Paper. And what they want, this is what they believe would make a difference. Um, they want a mental health designated lead in every single school by, uh, by 2025. They also want mental health support teams, and these sound like sort of like CAMS teams, but they're based in the community. Um, so they're trying to deal with the mild to moderate, trying to offer early intervention so that we can stop the, the, uh, the, the flood of referrals going to CAMS team, or CAMS teams are already overwhelmed and are find it difficult to cope because everything is referred to CAMS teams. Um, so they believe that this will uh, reduce waiting times, and they're trying to highlight that they want uh, young people to be seen within four weeks when they present rather than um, you know the length of time that you're waiting to go to camp. They also highlighted, which this is, and this is, what we're, this is where we believe we're tapping into, um, that there needs to be a better improvement of mental health and this needs to include information on social media, research on how to support families um, and, al and also how to prevent, you know, the key message is how to prevent uh, these, these particular issues happening in our young people in schools. Uh, but just to tell you a little bit about um, the, the Department of Education here in Northern Ireland in October 2018, they kind of had a report on mental health and wellbeing provision in schools and I thought this was interesting to highlight because we, I think we still have a little bit of work to do and I think if the government gets in place this has to be addressed. They presented some information about the extent of the different policies and types of policies that are presented on school websites and this is here in Northern Ireland. So within 90 schools, 45 primary schools, 45 post-primary schools, um, mental health as a policy was only published in, for the primary schools, 4% of schools, and only 2% in the post-primary schools. And the reason for that appears to be um, that they've kind of identified that mental health is most likely embedded into their behaviour policies. And if you can see the top one there, school behaviour, school behaviour, they have uh, policies on that, 100% almost in both primary and post-primary. But the teachers believe that mental health is a behavioural issue. They're indicating that schools are identifying pupils' additional emotional and psychological needs by the extent of their disruptive behaviour. Uh, so there's a kind of a misunderstanding uh, as to the point that we're kind of getting across um, that the school leaders and the Department of Education need to change that shift. There has to be a shift in thinking about that. Um, that it's not necessarily a, a behavioural issue. This is, this is just the presentation of it. Um, so with only 4% reporting mental health policies, um, why is that? Well, basically there's no duty on schools to have separate mental health policies at the minute, so that has to change. Um, but there needs to be training now to really enable schools to, uh, to kind of have a more comprehensive understanding uh, between the links uh, of mental health and behaviour and trying to address them holistically and not be thinking um, you know, that anxiety, depression and self-harm are, are kind of disruptive behaviours uh, because, because they're not. So we have to shift this discourse of guidance and training from behaviour and behaviour management and focus more on mental health, well-being and emotional resilience in schools. Now there's some schools really taking this on, it's really starting to happen over the, over the last couple of years. 
But what is being provided? There obviously is the counselling, there's the pastoral care, there's nurture rooms being set up. Um, there's also um, there's also targeted support for, for young people displaying emotional behaviour difficulties. There's some uh, support for trying to promote people's self-esteem and there's some resilience programme. But there's a little evidence uh, uh, based around the types of programmes offered. Who delivers it? Is a teacher delivered? Is it a mental health professional comes and delivers it? Who's delivering it? What training have they had? Um, so there's, there's little information about that and we, this is something that we feel we need to try and address. Now there's other local health, I'm not going to go through them, the Northern Ireland recommendations, um, uh, but a, a, and these were reported in the uh, House of Commons recently and the Northern, and I'm not going to go into what England, Scotland, Wales do, but all I can tell you is that they are trying to meet more of the Green Paper recommendations than Northern Ireland are. Um, so if you look on, the, on this particular web page here, um, the House of Commons, you can look it up yourself, looking at mental health and wellbeing in schools, um, you know they have like pages and pages of what they're doing in Scotland, England and Wales, but Northern Ireland, this is what's reported. The counselling services, uh, they're reporting the, the curriculum uh, that's called personal development and the learning for life and work. But what we know from a study that's carried out at Ulster University as well by Siobhan Lee um, uh, and Nicole Bond is that when they reviewed what actually was being delivered here, it's quite sporadic, it's quite ad hoc, it is not um, there's no school doing anything exactly the same um, and that's the issue that's that's the problem because you're not going to make an impact you're not going to make any change if there isn't some kind of evidence base to or something you know, let's just use something uh, that's that we know is, is working so there's the other i matter policies uh, that you can look at yourself if you want i'm not going to go into them but i'm going to tell you now and i'm going to move on very soon to our next speaker but i'm going to try to tell you well, what, what we've been doing what we've been trying to work on is let's just pilot something, let's just try and look at how we can prevent mental health in schools, how we can implement a curriculum based mental health programme that has a theoretical framework and we're using the HOPE theory as the theoretical framework and we're going to tell you our, our story uh, to date. So we, um, being aware that there's prevention and early intervention approaches that we can use, early intervention, we just, I don't think we can do that yet until we get the uh, government in place, until we get some funding uh, but to offer, you know, the, the early you know, treat the early signs of anxiety, treat it, you know, with uh, low intensity CBT, or the talking therapies, you know, have, have that support team that they identified in the green paper. So that's something that's hopefully going to come down the line. But there's something that we can do before that, which is the preventative approach. Um, and this is trying to uh, do something uh, that's going to teach young people how, how to cope with particular issues that are, they're presenting with. Now the guidance that I uh, to help me su to support me, I want to know what's happening around the rest of the world. You know, not just um, we have to we have to kind of get a sense of, of what, what evidence works. And the, the global mental health position, the, the sustainable development goals. But Catherine has been very heavily involved, and she'll talk about her, her global the global mental health movement that she's been involved with. They've really prioritised mental health and wellbeing now in early intervention. And in particular, the policy actions around the world are really targeting school-based interventions to support the prevention of childhood mental disorders. There's a recognition that there's this re need for refocus and that there's a preventative strategies that, that we need to put in place. And the literature that we've explored, international research is telling us that school-based prevention strategies can uh, need to introduce trauma-sensitive approaches, identifying young people with ACEs, and how that, that impacts their ability to learn, uh, reducing emotion oriented based coping strategies and be teaching more emotion regulation skills, reduce avoidant behaviour, encourage the adoption of more ad adaptive coping strategies as well. So that's what, what the evidence is telling us. The school setting is the ideal place for that. Um, and, and we need to try and recognise that whilst PE, physical education is a, as a subject that's standardised, we think that MEE, mental, emotional and education, should also be something that should be introduced. And yes, just yesterday we, we met, the team of us met with a, a, a school principal who's a real trailblazer in Oak Grove Integrated College in Derry and she has introduced an MEE module to every year eight pupil um, that is going to commence in September and this will incorporate uh, everything from trauma-informed to fruitful minds and it's literally embedded with the curriculum. It's not a little add-on as part of your uh, form class, 
it is, a, it is set within, it is embedded within the timetable, They're lined up the same way as English maths PE. Um, and this is something that, that seems to be promoted uh, as well in the, in the, the global uh, literature. Other meta-analysis, yes, there's stacks of information telling us that school-based approaches can improve skills, positive attitudes, pro-social behaviour, it just goes on and on. There's other systematic reviews are telling us that it shows positive effects in students' emotional behaviour, well-being, their self-efficacy and coping skills. So we wanted to source something then. With that information in mind, you know, with having looked at the evidence, looked at the research, um, looked at the prevalence rates, we wanted to know well, what, what do we want. So we wanted something that had a theoretical framework. We wanted lessons to be bedded into the school curriculum, not just one-off lessons that somebody comes in from outside, teaches it once, and cheerio, I'll see you next year again. Uh, we wanted something that had potential to be whole school. We wanted lessons that were clearly designed and developed and that there, was, there were well-supported materials that you could easily train other people uh, to, to use them. We wanted them to be easily replicated so that everybody could pick up the same uh, materials and deliver it the same way. We wanted something that had a very strong consulting team. And Catherine will describe to you the consultant team that were involved in creating each of these lessons. And some of them, she can describe who they are. Um, but um, there, there are psychologists, psychiatrists, educators, there's a, a big team of people supporting the development of each of these lessons. But we also wanted something to tap into the protective factors that we highlighted to you earlier. Something that would emotionally, you know, help support regulate emotions. Something that will support uh, introducing how to problem solve. You know, how to stop ruminating uh, about a problem. How to deal with worry as it happens. You know, teach young people the skills to be able to do that. And let's talk about it, you know, as well, and reduce the stigma. And something that was free to use as well, which Catherine has been so generous that she's created this programme. She's made it freely, publicly available for everyone to use, which is phenomenal. We're so grateful to Catherine for, for doing that. So Mary Dunn found the programme. She sourced it, made the connection with Catherine and brought it here. And asked us, could we pilot this? Could we give it a go? But the other last thing I wanted to highlight, and this is just uh, recently too, about emotional regulation. Um, we've carried a recent study at Ulster University and it was trying to predict what predicts anxiety, depression, self-harm as well. And this is just very recent. We did a latent class analysis and we were able to show that you, those young people who had very low emotional regulation, they were very, very clearly uh, cut across in terms of predicting all the symptoms, anxiety, depression, and self-harm young people. But we also know that the Hope Minds programme can actually work very, very, it does do a lot of, uh, to try and teach young people how to regulate their emotions. And does it in a very fun uh, way, you know, as if you were learning any other skill. You know, it does it in a way that reduces any stigma around it. Um, but I think Hopeful Minds is also a trauma-informed approach because it helps, the, the whole essence about what it means helps uh, people to understand how to overcome adversity, um, how to cope and deal with stressors, as I said, how to problem solve, how to build connections and positive relationships with other with people. It also raises awareness about their emotions, fight or flight responses, how the brain works, and how it doesn't work uh, for learning if, if they're stressed. So I'm going to come to a very soon close of my presentation now, and I want to try and prepare Catherine but I'll just tell you that the program is for seven, designed for seven to 14 year olds. So your P6, P7 class, but also your year eight, year nine, and potentially year 10. Okay, and Catherine will tell you a little bit about herself when she stands up. But it's a 12 lesson uh, 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 curriculum, it's one hour a week. Um, it equips, as I said, young people uh, with uh, an, an, an education, the teachers as well and the parents with the tools that they need to find and maintain hope even in the most trying times. So it's not only trying to prevent, it's also trying to improve mental health in, in, young, in young people. Um, again, well, in terms of defining hope, I, the, Mary's going to be much better doing that. So is Nigel, so will, will Catherine. But I just thought this was a lovely little image because one of the lessons they ask a, young, a child, well, what does hope mean to you? And I thought this one was really kind of captured in a very, very simple way. Um, it's basically this child, her definition of hope for her was that hope is being able to accomplish anything when you believe in yourself. So this is instilling a kind of a, a, a trait within a young person, a belief within themselves. It doesn't matter what they experience or what they face, if they face a failure, if they face bullying, if they face whatever it might be, 
that they're going to have the tools to be able to overcome that um, uh, if, they, if, they, if they understand what hope means. So I'm gonna, uh, when I come back at the end, I'll talk a little bit further about our <coughs> hypotheses uh, for our pilot studies and the, the method that we use in our outcomes. But I just wanted to highlight as well that whenever Mary mentioned to me about hope, I was initially kind of questioning, well, what do you mean? Are you talking about spiritual hope? What, 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 do you, what do you mean? So I had to do a bit of digging and a bit of reading around it myself, and I found that there's a stack of literature on hope and hope theory uh, that I didn't know about. Snyder seems to be the pioneering theorist for this, and he talks a lot about the intrinsic benefits of t uh, holding uh, that particular hope uh, belief within a young person. We also have Martin Seligman, who's very famous in the world of psychology, he talks about uh, the psychologist's journey from helplessness to op optimism using the hope circuit. Um, and hope itself, just to define it for you, and you'll hear it again, um, and I don't want to be repetitive with my other colleagues, but I think it's just, I'll finalise this. Um, hope is defined as goal-directed thinking, in which in the individual has the perceived ability to find routes to goals, which is called pathways thinking, and the motivation to use those routes, and this is called agency thinking. This implies that when individuals learn to be more hopeful, they will be more likely to make commitments, set goals, and work effectively to attaining those particular goals as, as well. So there's lots of more interesting ways that my other speakers will really bring that to life, okay? I just, but I just need to give you the, the academic theoretical definition of, of what it is, and also to tell you that uh, when I snooped in the literature a little bit further, I found some amazing uh, findings in, uh, in terms of what hope can do. So research indicates that hope, the, the goal pursuit thoughts, can influence esteem, can increase confidence and empowerment, it can increase just self-belief and self-efficacy. Uh, it can also act as a source of resilience, and it can also, the hopeful minds can promote that, that, that resilience even further when students actually believe that the personal characteristics can be developed and that they're not fixed, their resilience and performance actually increased as well. Um, so those things were really important for me to, to learn about before I embarked on introducing the program. But also children with lower levels of hope, what we find as well, um, that they're consistently uh, uh, shown that lower scores in, a, scores in a hope measure were related to several negative outcomes uh, so, uh, relating to psychological distress uh, and this included depressive symptoms as well. So this is all new information to me. I'd never come across you know, this whole concept of hope before and I was really uh, surprised to, to kind of find it. Why have we not been? Um, so yes, bringing it to Northern Ireland, these were the team of people. Mary sourced it, um, brought it here. She was the, the mental health promotion specialist in the Western Trust. She approached me to do the evaluation, but there was also a community lead as well. It's important to highlight. We really needed to embrace the community uh, groups uh, to support, coordinate, and linking in with schools. There was so much that they had to do. Linking in uh, parents, getting parents involved, training up people. They were, they were fantastic and they were very much needed as well. At that time that we did the pilot, uh, we had six uh, post-primary schools in 16, 17, and 14, and 17, 18. That, the training of facilitators, I'm not going to announce it, I'm going to let Mary announce how many people she has trained now. But at that time, we trained 88 people with no funding at all. So we carried out the research evaluation as well, just to highlight, I had five master's students working on it across the two years. So in the absence of trying to get important funding, I couldn't wait. I, don't, I wasn't prepared to wait, you know, to get fun to do this. It was a lot of work, but I just thought, you know, our master's students want to engage in really important studies, and I thought, well, I just pull them all together, and we're just going to do this and get some preliminary evidence to see if we can do a full trial, you know, in the future. Um, so I, we also have taken this to Malaysia. Um, we've connected uh, with uh, through a Global Challenge Research Fund, and it's been piloted there. I don't have the thinkings to tell you. We've been seeking them uh, uh, from from our partner there. She's Professor C. D. Uh, Radz Radzab, uh, but she hasn't been able to give it to us just yet. But it has been rolled out in several different schools in Malaysia as well. And Catherine will tell you where else it's been piloted in South Africa, China, lots of different places. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it there, and I'm going to come back to telling you about the outcomes of the study. And I want to pass it over. Now to Catherine Wojcicki. Um, I'm so delighted she's flown all the way in from uh, Nevada, Reno, Nevada. So thank you for listening to me for the first 
part of the of the talk, I'm going to now hand you over to Catherine. Okay, thank you so much.